3 of Genesis. And this evening I want to begin a series of character study uh, type messages. And uh, the title of the character study will be Good Examples of Bad Examples. Good Examples of Bad Examples. And uh, I'll give you a little explanation of where we're coming from on it, but I hope that and trust that it will be a help for us. Good examples of bad examples. Genesis is the first book in your Bible. Word means beginning, so uh, it's in the beginning of your Bible. And it begins with in the beginning. So if you know that, you're ahead of the game. Genesis chapter 3. Is everybody there? If you found it, uh, you know, isn't it terrible how preachers always say, if you found it, look up this way, and then they make you look away from it, and then they start reading it? Okay, so if you found it, look down, <laughs> and we'll start reading in verse, we'll just read verse 7 tonight for our text, shall we? Uh, oh, that's wrong. Uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. I said it wrong. If thou doest well... Shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Well, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us as we look at the example of Cain this evening to see man in his character and his capability, and to see you in your character. And Father, in it this evening, may we especially see your mercy. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think you know the story. And by the way, if you're studying your Bible and if you've never made a book study of Genesis, let me just help you with your study in Genesis because uh, when people study a, a book like Genesis, a lot of times there's so much material in it that you kind of lose focus of the overall theme of Genesis. And I'm not sure that anybody's ever helped me with this, but I know 100% for sure that this is the way that Genesis is laid out is that Genesis uh, really traces from the beginning of the original sin, it traces from the promise of the Messiah, that is the promise that from the seed of the woman, the serpent's head is going to be bruised. It traces that seed of people, or that lineage of people, who believed in Jesus, and it also traces those people who did not. And so there are two lines traced all the way through Genesis. You'll have the line of the believing individuals, and you'll have the line of the unbelievers until you come to the days of Noah. And then the Bible talks about how that everyone did evil in the sight of God. The sons of God married the daughters of men. So many people are unnecessarily confused and believe in aliens and that sort of nonsense because of a misinterpret. I'm serious. So many people come with so many wacky doctrinal problems. It's a real problem doctrinally. Did you know that? for a man who is a little lower than the angels to intermingle or intermarry with angels, that creates a pretty major theological problem. It has implications that have to do with your salvation. So either God's confused about salvation, or there's just a real simple answer in the Scripture for it. And so, just want to just suggest to you that the sons of God and the daughters of men, uh, the daughters of men are the descendants of Cain, the sons of God are the descendants of Seth, and that's the layout in the book, by the way. You hear get all the genealogies of Seth and all the genealogies of Cain, and then they get together, and then Noah's the last guy standing who's righteous on the earth. Okay, that's how it's laid out. If you are a grammarian or a person who is able to outline or do English, uh, then it's pretty simple. If you are a dreamer who believes in aliens, then you come up with some wacky doctrine, as many commentaries have. And so that's there for you for fun this evening. It's not the purpose of the message this evening, actually. Here's the deal was in the series that we're going to be going through in the next several weeks. I have bumped into, in Christianity and counseling with people and dealing with individuals, I have bumped into some really irrational theology over the years. And I found that the source of it usually is the pulpit. Usually it's preachers <laughs> preaching things and people get notions and their notions are just undoctrinal and unbiblical. And many of those undoctrinal, unbiblical notions come from things happening and being recorded honestly in the Scripture and people taking the idea of the whole, it happened in the Bible. You know, I love that phrase. 
it happened in the Bible or in Bible times. You know, whatever that means. That's, you know, what, 4,000 years, a span of 4,000 years or Bible times. If you want to take it that way, not everybody was quite biblical in those times, but there's just funny things that people say or we don't think about what they mean when we say them. But it happened in the Bible, and so, you know, God wants it is the idea. I heard a, a message teaching that God loves divorce, basically. I'm serious. A while back, and I heard a message on it. And uh, in the message, a preacher who ought to have known better explicitly stated that polygamy was allowed in the Old Testament. I mean, God just endorsed, stamped, you know, you know, polygamy. You know, well, you know, we don't agree with everything that God's always allowed. You know, polygamy was allowed in the Bible. Well, my friend, polygamy is documented in the Old Testament of the Scripture. It's also expressly forbidden. It's expressly forbidden over and again. And so when you see David committing adultery through a polygamy, you don't find God saying, well, this is the good thing about David. And he was a man after God's own heart. God's a polygamist. I'm being pretty sarcastic there. I hope you catch the dripping sarcasm in the statement. Uh, there's a lot of nonsensical doctrine just because people say, well, it happened, and so God wanted it, essentially. That's the other nonsense. You know, there's folks that doctrinally believe, well, God is the source or God is the cause of evil. And they'll twist scriptures to make the Bible say that. And so because people did things and God is responsible for evil, God wanted this. You know, God wanted two lines. A line of evil and a line of good men. You know, and that happened. No, 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 no. See, the difference between the Scripture and any other religious book is actually that the Scripture <laughs> is honest about the fallacies of man. In other words, when Elijah messed up and he said something wrong, he said, I own all the eye. And what did, what did God say to Elijah when he said something wrong? Seven. He said, oh, just, there's 7,000 people that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. It's not just you, Elijah. You're wrong. There are many times that we see something and you know, we just think, well, you know, Elijah said it. Well, if you take Elijah's word for it, my friend, there was only, he was the last man standing on earth that was faithful to God. But God said, well, I've got 7,000 in this country. 7,000 pretty close proximity people that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so you're not the only one, Elijah. And there's a lot of that kind of thing in the Scripture where you find men sinning. And what is the thread? What is the theme of it? We actually saw it a couple of weeks ago when we began our series in Matthew, didn't we? When we looked at the lineage that Matthew, that the Holy Spirit used, you were just questioned, why did the Holy Spirit trace the lineage of Joseph when Joseph was not the father of Jesus? God is the father of Jesus. But why was the lineage of Joseph traced? When Jehoiakim, according to uh, Jeremiah chapter 22, was rejected forever from having a descendant to sit on the throne of the king of David. Why that lineage? Why is it traced? Well, because the scripture shows that God can still use people. God can use imperfect people. And God can use people that come from lousy people by His grace and by His mercy. It's one of the most beautiful pictures you ever see when you study the genealogies in Matthew. In that genealogy of Matthew, you have Judah. Not the guy I'd have chosen out of Jacob's sons. I'd have chosen Joseph to be in the lineage of Christ, wouldn't you? You have Judah. You have Tamar. <laughs> Boy, that was a messed up situation, wasn't it? Daughter-in-law or father and uh, playing the, uh, like a harlot to be in, be in, then being in the lineage of Christ. Whew. Then you have Ruth. You have Rahab. I mean, you just look at the people in the lineage of Jesus Christ. What's the point of that genealogy that traces Jehoiakim, the very man whom God said, you'll never have a seed set on the throne of David forever. What's the point of it? Well, because The point is that God's character and God's mercy, God's just so good and God is so gracious that He can take people who should not be good enough, who should not be qualified, and because of faith, God can use them. God can use anyone. Well, there oughtn't to be any Christian who doubts that God can use anyone if you've ever studied the genealogies in Matthew. It's a beautiful picture. And then you see Joseph, this man who was espoused to Mary, the Bible calling him a just man. Just man. You study that and you look at what that means. Here's a guy who's disqualified from sitting on the throne of David and God said he's just. What a wonderful picture that is. And so I want to look at for the next several weeks I want to look at good examples of bad examples. Sometimes people do character studies. 
and in the Bible, and, and I think character studies can be a real help. Matter of fact, I think they're very devotional, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know, you get a book of character studies. A lot of times they're pretty wacky, to be quite honest with you. A lot of times I have a real problem with the application that people make in character studies. It seems like a little far-fetched or a little bit extra biblical sometimes. But I would just like to take a different approach. Instead of looking at good examples, how about looking at lousy examples and uh, just seeing God and His mercy in those things. And we'll begin with Cain. There's probably not a better start for a bad start than Cain's start, except for his dad's start. <laughs> right? I mean, Adam messed up, didn't he? he uh, the Bible says about Adam, the father of Cain, the Bible says that Eve, being deceived, was in the transgression, but Adam was not deceived. There's a big difference between Adam's decision to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and Eve's decision. Eve believed the serpent. Adam didn't believe the serpent. He just ate it anyway. That's what the Bible says about Adam. So that's the father of Cain. That's Cain's father. And so we see in verse 1 of chapter 4, Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Well, she was wrong about that. Again, she buried his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? In our text this evening, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. God gives Cain a very, very simple ultimatum. Now, there's a little bit of background to this, and I don't think probably for the group this evening it's entirely necessary to cover. God established a sacrifice, didn't He? When He covered Adam and Eve with the skins of a lamb. God established a sacrifice where a lamb shed his life in order to be the covering for Adam and Eve after they'd sinned against God. That's the picture. God has always required a blood sacrifice because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And there is no such thing as death which is the wage for sin without the shedding of blood. And so Cain's sacrifice was not what God asked for, plain and simple, clearly. The Bible just simply puts it, Cain tilled the ground. He, was a, he planted things. He grew things. And Abel, he raised sheep, if you will, or he raised animals. And Cain brought God a sacrifice of what he raised or what he had produced or what he had grown. We're sometimes not very fair to God in this one. Sometimes we kind of, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we just think things through like we are sitting in the judgment seat and we're the judge and we just think, well, you know something, Cain just gave what he had. How many of you all have ever thought, well, it's just Cain just gave what he had? I mean, he grew that, he, he, he invested in that. It's, it meant a lot to Cain what he gave, and he just gave what he had. How many of us have thought that? We all have, unless you don't think. Okay, be honest about it. We've all thought, well, Cain just brought what he had. I mean, he just did, he just did what he could, you know? Well, Cain gave something that was significant to him. There's no question about that. Right? I mean, he grew... He was proud of what he grew. He invested his sweat from his brow into growing things in the ground. and He was proud of the sacrifice he brought to God. There's no question about that at all. Uh, but Cain knew very well what God required. You say, well, Pastor, he didn't have animals like Abel did. Well, you know, here's the neat thing about that. Cain had a brother who raised animals. He could have traded I'm sorry, but it's just, it's just that simple. I mean, the reality of it is is that Abel probably wouldn't have minded eating something that Cain grew. Hey, I grew this. Would you like to trade? Sure. Right? Isn't that the way it's done? 
You don't have to raise animals to be able to sacrifice an animal. You can purchase an animal. You can barter an animal. Or you could raise an animal for the sacrifice. Well, just practically speaking, would it have been prohibitive for Cain to raise his own animal? Where did, where did Abel get his animals? Where did he get them? Huh? From God? Well, I mean, maybe his dad gave them to him. But, you know, they were kind of just there. You know, you had a world, a few people living in it. Now, probably by the, this time, there are, you know, a few hundred people living in the world. But there are animals for the taking. And if Cain had wanted to invest the time in going out and catching a lamb or bartering for a lamb or whatever, he could have raised his own. In other words, Cain made a choice not to bring a lamb. Do you see it? Of course, it was not, Cain brought his best, and Abel brought his best, and God liked Abel's best, but God didn't care about Cain's best. No, God required a blood sacrifice, and Cain knew it, and Abel knew it. And Cain said, you know, I've got something really neat. There are a lot of people that have thought that over the years, haven't there been? Mm -hmm. Remember Saul? <laughs> what happened when Saul said, you know, instead of destroying everything, I'll keep the best. And I'll offer, I mean... Who questions Saul's sincerity? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this for an offering to God. I mean, God never thought of this. I mean, I could keep these animals for a sacrifice. This is going to be great. I'm going to bring God the best sacrifice He's ever had. A sacrifice is a sacrifice. Stealing something is not a sacrifice. Getting something without cost is not a sacrifice. And see, throughout the ages and the annals of time, there have been people who have always tried to come to God naming their terms. And that's precisely what Cain is a good example of a bad example of. Cain expected to come to God and say, God, you had a good idea, but here's one that's better. God, you had a great idea, but here's one that's better. Let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 4. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, what did she say? I've gotten a man from the Lord. What was she referencing? What was Eve thinking when she said, she's holding this baby Cain? What was she saying when she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord? What? Um, salvation. From, I think his name actually means salvation, doesn't it? I don't remember. But it, but it was it was like he's going to be the one curse. that's what? going to save us. Acquisition. Okay. Was she wrong? So acquisition I've gotten. What? Was he wrong? Yes, yeah, she's wrong. Yeah, she was wrong. Well, what was she wrong about? Who did she think Cain was? What? She thought he was either the savior or he was the line of the savior. In other words, when Cain, little Cain, was born, she said, "This is what God said when He said." that the serpent's head's going to be bruised. This is the seed of promise Cain is. That's the expectation for which Cain was born. This firstborn son of mine is going to be the seed of promise. That was Cain's opportunity, my friend. Now, Cain's opportunity wasn't to be Jesus. God, God she, you know, he wasn't born of a virgin. Uh, he didn't fulfill all those promises. But... His parents had the full expectation that this is going to be a godly man. The expectation of Cain's parents is that this man is going to be in the lineage of Christ. That was the expectation for Cain. Well, you know, poor Cain. Oh, no, my, my friend Cain had a pretty good opportunity. Cain had the same opportunity that Esau had. But he profaned it. And so he's a good example of a bad example. You think for one second that Cain did not have a notion of what he was doing when he came to God who gave him the opportunity to be in the lineage of Christ. You think for one second Cain didn't know that, my friend. His mom knew it. It was the expectation she had. It's recorded in the Scripture. And this man was literally born with the opportunity to be in the lineage of Christ. Mom said, I've gotten a, gotten a man from the Lord. Instead, Cain said, well, God, 
We need to come to terms. Here's my offering. Take it or leave it. And God said, that's not an offering. That, is, that isn't a sacrifice. A sacrifice is shed blood. That's a sacrifice. This isn't a sacrifice. And it made Cain mad, ticked him off. He was wroth, the Bible says. Because God didn't see things from his perspective. My friend, people go to hell every day. Hear me. People go to hell every day because God doesn't see things from their perspective. Here's a news flash. He never will. Because their perspective is wrong. He's God. And man is created by God. And as, as Anthony quoted this evening, the theme formed is not going to tell God, this is how you ought to do things. God knows what He's doing. And Cain was a prime example of an individual who was born with opportunity, squandering it on his own pride. Do you think Cain might have heard some stories about who God was and how God was? Do you think mom and dad might have talked about the garden and walking with God? Do you think Moses found out about that? Any other reason than that Adam and Eve passed it down from generation to generation? See, Cain knew it. He knew what God had said. But Cain was swelled up in his own mind, his own mindset, and he brought God what he wished to bring, and he wanted God to come to terms with him. And friend, I'm going to just tell you something. God's never going to come to your terms. I hate to be the one to give you the reality check, but Cain is a good example of a bad example that God never comes to man's terms. When you come to God, the Bible says, He that cometh to God must... Believe that He is, and that He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Those are God's terms. You come to God, God's way. My friend, God's way is Jesus. A lot of people struggle with this, coming to God on His terms. It's one of the biggest obstacles or stumbling blocks to salvation is the exclusivity of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Cain was one of the first to say, well, God, here's another way. Here's the reason that sacrifice, that shedding blood, isn't such a big deal. And God said, oh, no, Cain. And then let's look at God. We've, we've done a pretty good job of looking at Cain, haven't we? Cain had great opportunity. Cain knew what the truth was. And Cain wholesale rejected the truth. Well, that's a fact. In our minds, we can think, oh, you know what I mean? He just did what he did, could. He just gave what he had. We're always ready to sit in judgment of God and pardon man. We're very ready to do that oftentimes. And my friend, I just want to tell you something. The facts are the facts. Cain knew what he was doing. Cain had the opportunity to do right, and he chose to offer God his deal on his terms. And you just can't do that with God. And Cain knew it, and it made him mad. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Let me ask you a question. If thou doest well, past, present, or future? Future. We've seen Cain. We've seen his pride. We know he knew what he was doing. We know that he failed in it. And now we're looking at God who said, If thou doest well. Future. In other words, God's attitude toward Cain is, Hey Cain, bring me the right offering. Why are you angry? Why are you upset? You know what the, you know what the deal is. Bring me what you're supposed to bring me. That's what God said. My friend, herein is a reminder of the character of God. God's always been this way. There's nothing more arrogant than a created, finite being trying to tell God what He should accept. There's nothing more arrogant than that. If you were God, and if I were God, as finite beings, we wouldn't take it, would we? 
You knew better. You knew what you were doing. Finito. Finished. You're done, Cain. Sorry. You knew better. You knew what you were doing. You're done. And God's response, <laughs> Cain, why don't you just bring me the right sacrifice? My friend, one of the distinct differences between God and us is long-suffering and mercy. I've learned this so many times in my life. I don't know how many times in my life I've just thought, God, you ought to kill me. How many of you all thought, you know what, God should just kill me? <laughs> I mean, honestly, God, if I were you, dead, gone, done. And honestly, God would be just and He'd be right to do so. It would be nothing against His character for God to say enough's enough with you and once is enough for you. And yet God says to Cain, Cain, why don't you just bring me the right sacrifice? So Cain went and made a blood sacrifice. So you want a blood sacrifice, I'll show you one. He killed his brother. That's arrogant, isn't it? You want to see innocent bloodshed, God? Here's one. I'm the seed of promise. <laughs> My mom got a man from the Lord. I'm the chosen one. And he killed his brother. Who brought God the right sacrifice, who was innocent. That's how that went down. Cain gave God a blood sacrifice. Killed his innocent brother. Verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said to Cain, unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? By the way, that's never the right question. The answer to the question is yes, you are. Just in case you're Charlie's roommate and he's late, the answer is yes, you are your brother's keeper. He said, What hast thou done? Verse 10, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tellest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. If you've never been here, you could avoid this by just looking at Cain's example of a bad example. It's a good example of a bad example of somebody who tries to be successful without God's blessing. Cain was a tiller of the ground up to this point. He was very successful as a tiller of the ground. And who, who allowed that? God did, actually. See, the deal is, is that Cain was good at what he did. He raised, he tilled the ground, he raised crops, and was good at it. And he actually thought that he was good at it because of himself. And God said, now let me tell you something about the ground now. Your brother's blood has been put into it, and now it's going to cry against you. And so now you can't raise anything, Cain. Nothing will grow for you. <laughs> Could I tell you that if you run from God, if you rebel against God, <laughs> you won't succeed? Listen, my friend, this is really for people that God loves and God knows. There's really great application here. Just do things God's way. Well, you know, I, I'll just... It's amazing how often we think that we have strength to do things which we don't. We think that our success comes from our wit or our cleverness or our talent, and we forget where that came from. From God. Isn't it incredible how God can take a bumbling idiot and make him successful? And God can take a pretty sharp person and just seems like everything they do just fails. And that's Cain now. Cain's a guy who could grow anything that can't grow anything. I mean, he may know how to plant the crop. He may know the right time of the year, but it just doesn't work. I mean, he just can't make it rain. Well, it wouldn't have rained in his day. He just can't make the weather cooperate. He just can't make the soil cooperate. Everything's wrong. 
And he's just especially cursed from it. And now here's Cain's response in verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment's greater than I can bear. Now isn't this incredible? What is actually Cain's punishment? What has God said Cain's punishment actually is? You can't grow crops anymore, Cain. And he said, I just can't stand it. Do yeah. you, you see the irony in it? He murdered his brother. He's not sorry he murdered his brother. He offered God the wrong sacrifice. He was born the man from the Lord with great opportunity. He squandered that. He's not sorry about that. He's not sorry he's murdering his brother. But he is just heartbroken that he can no longer grow plants. It makes me chuckle inside. You know what's, what makes things funny? Brother Taj and I were listening to comedians on our trip this last week. Most of them weren't funny. Some of them were. And what was funny about the ones that, were, that we thought were funny was that you could just relate to the people they were making fun of. Comedians always make fun of people. And it's like you knew the people they were making fun of or you could see that in yourself. That's where a lot of humor actually is. And what's funny about Cain here is that I just know so many people that are just like this. I mean, they just absolutely couldn't care less about God hiding His face from them. They couldn't care less about missing the opportunity to be used of God and have this great promise in their life. They couldn't care less about the terrible deeds they've done. They're upset because they can't grow plants. <laughs> and that's Cain. A good example of a bad example of misplaced priority. It's a good example of a bad example of misplaced priority. I mean, the thing that God did that really got Cain was stopped him from growing plants. Did you ever see that in the text? It's there, isn't it? And so now he says, here's what's going to happen to me now. He said in verse 14, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. Oh! Does that bother you now, Cain? Does that bother you now? From God's face you're hid? And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. He said, on top of that, people are going to try to kill me now because I killed Cain. Is there remorse in this? Is there any remorse? No. It's just life's terrible, God. You're not good. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain... Okay, so we looked at Cain again, didn't we? Now let's look at God. The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain... Vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. I want to end there because we're not going to study through Genesis. That's not our purpose. We're just looking at a character, that man Cain. And we see here that God preserved Cain's life. In other words, God kept Cain from getting the same as he'd been given. Cain was upset because he couldn't grow plants. And Cain was upset because people might try to do to him what he'd done to Abel. There's a man with a seriously broken justice system. So, what do we do with this this evening? Well, the first thing we do is we look at God, and we look at His character, and then we look at Cain, and we look at His character, and we look for similarities. And then we try really hard to find dissimilarities. See, I can relate to Cain. There have been many times in my life when I've thought that God should th see things from my perspective. And if you'll be truthful and honest about it, you probably have as well. And then when I look at Cain and I look at God's response to Cain, I think, oh, I don't want to be like that guy. You know, the whole entire book of Proverbs is written to people that, if they will, can be wise enough to learn from the wisdom of those who've already done the wrong thing instead of going through the same thing over and over again. There are those that have to learn, it seems, 
not by listening, not by hearkening, not by heeding, but they just have to learn by doing things the wrong way and then having the consequences. No person has been the first to succeed at doing things man's way instead of God's way. Every generation always thinks they'll be the first one. Every person who does the same thing that everybody's always done, expecting different results, thinks that their situation is so unique and so different that God will surely see it from their perspective. And they're just like Cain. And friend, when I'm that way, I'm just like Cain and I don't want to be. Proverbs says, He that being often reproved hardened his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. If that's me, that's my end. If that's you, that's your end. So Cain is a good example of a bad example. Don't be like him. Don't be like Cain. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening as we go through the character studies in the next several weeks. I pray that you would help us to heed and hearken as we would see, this, as see similarities between ourselves and individuals who sin against you. May it be that we will turn from those things to a merciful God. We ask your help in these matters. God, I pray that when we are this way, you'd remind us of this example, of a bad example. And help us to turn from our prideful, wicked way, humble ourselves before you, and receive your mercy. God, I just thank you that you're the kind of a God that says to an arrogant man, if thou doest well, Lord, help us to do well. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.